Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Today, there's a shortage of young, skilled workers capable of replacing skilled baby boomers who are retiring in greater numbers each year. Examples of what I'm referring to include welders, industrial computer operators, machine operators, and people capable of maintaining industrial machines. Corporate managers are concerned about finding qualified replacement workers. They're also concerned about potential workers in their 20s and early 30s who lack skills such as workplace teamwork, written and verbal communication skills, the ability to be self-directed, the ability to stay on task, the ability to show up on time, and the ability to follow instructions. Our guest today is David Stecklin, the Executive Director of Madison County, Illinois Employment and Training Department. Mr. Stecklin is here to talk about these issues. He is a past president of the Illinois Workforce Partnership and of the Consortium of Vocational Education and Educators and Employers. David Stecklin, welcome to the conversation. Well, thank you, Lee. So let's start with that part of my uh, introduction there about the people you're dealing with mm -hmm. who are these uh, young people in their 20s and 30s. How serious is this, uh, is this education problem and the ability to show up, to work, and be self-directed? Well, I think you ask a two-part question, really. Uh, there are soft skills, and then those are there are the hard skills, the, as you mentioned, computer operators for machining, uh, the welding skills, the technical skills. But I think your question really revolves around those soft skills, so skills of teamwork, communication, critical thinking, uh, the ability to, uh, to see a problem and think it through and work with the team to solve it. it it's one of those things that is both acquired and, and through socialization, through our participation in the society, and, and it's also something that's experiential. Um, there's been a lot of debate over that issue. How do we improve on the soft skills of our workforce? Well, there are a number of ways to go about it, but I would offer that one of the easiest ways to address this is to make sure that we make the world of work something that's incorporated into the classroom, where teachers have expectations of individuals um, to perform as they would as if they were on a job because in my world I think school is about preparing people for not only life but to earn a living to live life. Yeah, I was just going to ask the question and seriously, the boom generation which is retiring, which are the experts today? Right. Now I don't know whether or not people of the past would say that the workers of today are as expert as they were because yeah. you know it's always better back there and I'm wondering whether if you know we have expectations and that they're not quite as bad as I portray them to be in the introduction on the other hand I do have personal dealings with young people and have found them to be undereducated despite the fact that like you were just talking about uh, education as prep for work uh, they don't seem to take it seriously. Some of them, uh, in the city of St. Louis, and we've had this conversation on this set before, half of the students don't graduate, and those half that do, half of them can barely read and write at a usable level. Well, I, I would say a couple of things about that. One is a statistic that I think I brought up the last time I was here. Of the 19-year-old individuals in this country, all of them, only half have ever had a job. Now that's sort of scary when you think about, I'm a baby boomer, I'm uh, getting ready to retire, as, as are a lot of my friends. The point is, I had a job when I was 14. Right. And you learn some of these soft skills in that way. Uh, it's called work experience, on-the-job training. There's a lot of names for it. But the thing is, we really have to start getting kids to actually be in work. And again, I'll go back to the schools. Because there's a lack of opportunities in an economy like we have today, there's a lot of jobs that kids used to take that might be taken by an adult in their 50s or 60s just to bridge the time between then and when they get ready to retire. 
So I think it's important that we create opportunities for young people to have a work experience. And the other thing I would say is uh, mentoring is very, very important. We live in a society where the divorce rate is fairly high. There's a lot of single parent households and there's not the time nor do I believe that it's a fault of that single parent, but there's a lot of times that kids just don't get the same kind of experiences that mm -hmm. a, a two-parent family would have. And it's a societal issue, but it's something I think that we could address. There's a lot of kids out there that are good kids. They just need both experience and instruction. I go back to mentoring. Uh, as we retire, what are we going to do with our time? Some of the best time we could spend, in my estimation, is to volunteer in schools, to be involved with vocational programs, career and technical education, so that we get kids a feel of what it's like to be successful and let them know that there's a future out there. Now you brought up the, uh, the concept of vocational education. Uh, at one time, um, when we were in high school and for generations before, high schools offered shop, mm -hmm. uh, auto mechanics, uh, electric shop, uh, there were there were plenty of hands-on training that was going on in the high schools and maybe right. even before the high schools. In your experience and your position, you deal with a lot of schools right now. Do you find that they have the capability to prepare these young people to do the kind of jobs that are available or will be available to them, these tech jobs? I think your question is, are they capable? Yes. Will they be able to? In many cases, no. And the reason for that is twofold. One is the number of vocational and technical centers, the CTE centers, are smaller. You know, those buildings that were dedicated, like a J.B. Johnson in Alton, that was dedicated to those hands-on skills. Mm -hmm. The second is funding. You know, yeah, maybe a band gets cut, maybe uh, the uh, the freshman football team does with one less coach, but that also means that there's not new equipment in a welding lab, or there's not the will to send a kid from one district to another and pay tuition over there. Uh, times are tough. So I'm going to answer your question by yes, they're capable, but can they do it? Not as well as we'd like. And, and that is a perfect example and gets back to my other point. In those kind of settings, they can make it work like. So when they're in a, a CTE program, they call it uh, career and technical education, as a welder, they can have the expectations of a boss being there who is actually their teacher, who takes a look at those soft skills, those communication skills, the ability to problem solve, and help them learn the right, right uh, workplace behaviors. Did you say that on the job or before? A before. Job? Before. Because that teacher acts just like a okay. boss would on a job. And that critique, which can be very valuable to these kids, doesn't get to happen in many cases right now. Because I was going to say, many employers just don't, uh, don't have the time or the desire to be teaching young people these skills, despite the fact that they actually need these people right. in order to, uh, I mean, we, we literally have you know, tens of thousands of, of uh, technical jobs that go begging. I mean, what's you're the expert. How many jobs are going baking nationally right now? The number that everyone hears is three million. Um, is it that great? I don't know, but I will say this. At least half of those jobs are being unfilled simply because we don't have that pipeline or that of kids coming out with just simple basic technical skills so that they could learn those uh, on the job. Uh, and again, it gets back to what you were talking about with the St. Louis School District. If you don't have some physics, if you don't have some algebra, if you don't have a little bit of geometry, there's a lot of things that you're really not going to be able to understand, and it gets back to problem solving and analysis. And that's so important. Um, we are sort of a schizophrenic society in some ways. We push everybody to go to college. But college is a lot of different things, and when people think of college, it's a four-year degree granting institution. But you know, there are community colleges that provide in two years or three lifetime careers for individuals to earn basically a family-sustaining living. Uh, keep in mind, you can still go to a community college and learn nursing. You can go there and get a welding degree, drafting. Uh, I personally have a friend who has gone through a two-year degree in drafting and she has asked me to help her with a resume from time to time. I know at last count she was making $55,000 a year. Mm -hmm. 
So those are the kinds of opportunities that I keep stressing. The other thing is, and I, I talked to you off the air a little bit about a, a, a YouTube clip that Mike Rowe did, the guy that did America's uh, Dirtiest Jobs and then Beyond America. But he is a great advocate for us learning, again, to respect people who work with their hands. And again, with a little bit of algebra, geometry, and, and physics background, people who are good with their hands can have a lifetime career. You can't send a toilet to uh, uh, India for, um, for, for service, yes. uh, same way with your car. So people who work with their hands are going to have opportunities for the rest of their life. Yeah, he made the point that um, <clears throat> uh, his grandfather right. seemed to inherently know what to do without reading a, uh, a manual. But he also said that um, before long, it's going to cost you more to have your plumber come out than to go see your psychiatrist. Well, uh, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, yes. Uh, we, we're a neurotic enough society without getting labeled. But, you know, the bottom line is, like you said, a plumber is going to be able to go out and charge $60 an hour, and you're going to have to have find somebody who's got insurance to go to that psychiatrist or their doctor. You know, you need a functioning toilet in the house. You, you could maybe get by with, uh, you know, one less doctor visit. And I, I think the thing we do is we respect doctors. We look at those professions as very noble. But we don't say that about our plumber. Well, when I was a kid growing up, um, my dad was part of that post-World War II generation. And his friends were people who were everything from industrial electricians to plumbers to uh, jacks of all trade. Mm -hmm. And those guys had the same respect in the community as did uh, a doctor or a lawyer or, or an accountant because they had a noble profession. They worked every day. Uh, they showed up on time and they knew what they were doing. We need, to, we need to talk about that and have that conversation. Same thing holds true for manufacturing. You know, people can have great careers in manufacturing. We have some real opportunities in Madison County if you take a look at U.S. Steel, uh, Phillips 66, such, sort of the top tier of manufacturing, but great companies with great great benefits and more than uh, a living wage pay scale. Mm -hmm. Those folks are, are getting older too and we're going to need people to move into manufacturing. I think that's an important area that we need to, to keep going in Madison County. We're very fortunate. I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Cleveland, which was another manufacturing center. But when I came here and uh, heard stories about Alton in the old days, old days meaning post-World War II, up all the way through into the early 70s where a kid could graduate from high school and knock on the first factory door, boom, come on in, right. you know? And then if he got sick of that, then, you know, it's like, get out, I'm leaving, go to the next factory door, come on in. But we just had uh, the, the new mayor of Alton here about a week ago, and uh, he, you know, he was listing the, the manufacturing facilities that were still left in Alton, mm -hmm. and that list is pretty thin. Uh, you and I both remember the uh, early and mid 70s the, when the the old Northwest was declared the Rust Belt, mm -hmm. and a lot of manufacturers fled from uh, from this area to Texas, Mississippi, South Carolina, and then eventually to Mexico. What is it that's being done in this local area by the business community to attract industrial jobs? Well, I think it's not up to the business community, it's up to the community as a whole. I think one of the things we do is address the issue we were just talking about. You have to have a prepared workforce. It's not what it used to be. It's not location, 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 mm -hmm. although we have a tremendous advantage here. Our ability to transport goods is incredible, probably mm -hmm. unparalleled. We have the river, we have runways, we have roads, uh, we have rails. We have five class one rails that come through the area. So what we have to do is package that together and as a community sell our ability to meet their workforce needs, transportation needs. We also have a very abundant supply of water, which is critical in many manufacturing. And I think we can start to onshore manufacturing again. But I think it's important. There's a great blog I, I follow, and this gentleman is a site selector for corporations. And what he talks about is workforce is very important. He talks about a little small town in Alabama that was competing for a manufacturer. 
And when they brought the manufacturer in, because he wasn't sure, and they took him to the local community college where he walked down a hallway and through big glass windows saw uh, robotics classes, uh, computer and numerically controlled machining going on. And he got to the third window and he goes, that's the very same processor that we're using at our plant. And that sold it, that sealed the deal. So again, I think it's a combination of business, uh, education, government, the private sector, all working together to say what we have in this area. And we have tremendous assets here. What success has, uh, let's be specific, Madison County, Illinois had in that process that you just described? Well, I, I think one of the <clears throat> things you can take a look at is the uh, logistics industry that is down at the Gateway Center. That's there because of some of the resources I just met mentioned. And what you'll find is that's also an advantage for a manufacturer because transportation of goods is that shipping and receiving is becoming more and more critical as part of their bottom line comes in. So I think we've been very fortunate to have that go on. We've also seen a tremendous investment at, uh, at that time. It was ConocoPhillips, now it's the Phillips plant. Four billion dollars of investment there. Sun Coke in Granite City, a uh, half billion dollar investment there. Uh, we keep seeing that, that corporations see Madison County as a good place to do business in spite of all the bad press Illinois gets as a whole. Uh, and I think a big part of that has to do with the workforce. One other example I'll give you, and I really like this one, and it's Kraft Food in uh, Granite City. They make the Capri Sun package mm -hmm. stuff. They, they competed with four other plants, for, or three other plants, for an expansion of a line. They got it in Granite City. They got it in Granite City because they beat out the Memphis and Atlanta. It wasn't you know, somebody in China they were competing against, they're competing right here. And their workforce is what sold the deal. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, one of the things that I thought about momentarily was that discipline used to be learned by the male workforce when they went through the Army and did a two-year stint. We don't have that so much anymore, do we? No. Um, with an all-volunteer army, it's, it, it's a different situation. There are opportunities. There are uh, federal programs for, for service to the country, um, probably like everything else, underfunded at this point in time. But uh, you're right. The, the whole work ethic kind of thing that, that shot in the arm, if you will, that came through military service is not there. We do a lot now with reservists, et cetera which is another great asset that we need to capitalize on as our young men and women come home. Uh, they have the skills that are needed in a workplace, particularly the discipline and leadership. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that uh, uh, in the military, guys, now gals too, uh, have the opportunity to learn things that they would ordinarily never have learned. Right. Electronics, uh, just dealing with heavy equipment, uh, being able, you know, to dig holes, you know, <laughs> the engineering core, uh, all these skills that are absolutely necessary if we're going to, you know, build bridges, build roads, build new buildings. Um, so let's come down to, you know, specifically your your program. Mm -hmm. What uh, what do you, what is the goal of your program, and how well are you accomplishing that? Well, uh, right now, in the whole line we're talking about, we have a grant that we received, and it's called the ATOM grant, A-T-I-M. It's Advanced Training uh, for Illinois Manufacturers. And we do it both in the production and logistics side of manufacturing. We're just getting off the ground, so I'll, I'll tell you what the success will be like in six months to a year, uh, if you have me back at that point. But uh, the point of this program is to bring folks in who are interested in the manufacturing industry and that sector of our so economy. Young, young people? Young yeah. people, uh, but a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, even a 40-year-old. It doesn't really matter to us. We just want people who are interested and that have some future in that industry. We will put them into a short-term training. We're not going to have a two-year program. We've gone to industry and they say, these are the skills we need. We're going to train specifically in just those. We, uh, we also do drug testing and background checks. We make sure before we invest public monies that we have a fairly good success rate uh, just at that level. Right. After folks are done, then we can go to uh, some of our partner businesses and say, okay, they have these skills that you said were necessary. Now, when you have an opening, we want you to give them a chance. 
I think we're going to have great success. Uh, this program actually covers 11 counties. It goes as far south as uh, Monroe and, and St. Clair and all the way up to uh, Grafton and, and points a little bit north of there and over to Bond County. So we've got the whole Metro East involved. We have a number of businesses and we're going to do training and everything from welding to uh, computer and numeric controlled machining. We're going to do logistics. Uh, we also are doing a lot of welding as well as industrial and commercial maintenance. So we have a program available now to address the whole issue that we're talking about. In addition to that, we run a year-round program and training, and we're very selective about the occupations we train in. We do an analysis each year. We see which ones are the occupations and which one of our vendors has good results. So. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, RN, we could probably place as many as we can train uh, welders, truck drivers. We have a number of programs also in uh, computer sciences. Those are all doing well. Uh, some of the programs that used to do well do, don't do that well anymore, and so we eliminate those. So people who come into the program can be assured that we've done our due diligence, that the areas we are talking about training, they have a good likelihood of finding employment. Is the business community kind of directing you as to what, what their needs are? Absolutely. We uh, have a workforce investment board. The majority of that is made up of private business, and they oversee how we, how we allocate our money. Uh, the other thing is, I will say this, I've got a great board that we work with, but the business community as a whole has to step up and engage education and government and give us a little bit more information. I think it's important that... Uh, that we give business to be a full partner in the training of the workforce that they need. Yeah, well, you know, you mentioned about money, and uh, I'm sitting here thinking as you're talking about, uh, you know, the funds that you have to have in order to train these people to specific skills. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the ten to fourteen thousand dollars a year that public education is spending on young people. And I'm wondering why that ten to fourteen thousand a year isn't being honed in the direction of what you're talking about to actually train <laughs> young people to fulfill functions as opposed to warehouse them. Well, um, and, and, and I know that's more rhetorical. That's that's you know that's that's Dr. Hightower kind of question. Right, and uh, I prefer that he answered for himself. <coughs> I will say this that. Uh, we find our funds being cut each year as well. Sequestration, as an example, has affected us. Uh, you we, get federal funds or state funds? Federal funds. Okay. All of our funding comes directly from the Fed to the state and then down to uh, uh, the local level. Uh, as, as recently as five years ago, we had an office in Greenville, Granite City, Glen Carbon, and in, in Alton. Today we have an office in East Alton. We've consolidated all of our operations there, and we still have a, a small office in Greenville, actually uh, one staff person and a part-time individual. It has become more and more difficult for us. We have less and less resources, less staff, and some of what we do is not only the training, but the matching, the, the career counseling, trying to get folks to have some realistic expectations. You know, uh, everybody remembers Mrs. Robinson and the great line, get into plastics. Well, then it was computers. So everybody who came in the door thought if they went to a community college, did two years in a computer science sort of study, they were going to come out of there and make $80,000 a year and maybe invent Facebook. It doesn't work that way. And so it's, a, it's an education and re-education process that our staff has to do to have people have realistic expectations. And so, you know, I, I think that's what's critical about high school as well. Um, I was very fortunate to be involved with the State Department grant some years back and I got to see a lot of how they do things in, in some of the European countries. They are much more uh, compartmentalized. They, they test kids much earlier and they put them in various directions, whether it's vocational, higher education, uh, technical and professional. But they do that analysis and they, more, they, they do it earlier. They have kids in a, in a direction that they, they know that they're going to be able to find a job in and it'll suit their talents. Um, we're the land of the free, and so we allow a lot of free choice. 
not always uh, in our best interest, but at least it's, it's politically what we're supposed to do. But I do believe that we need to do a better job of counseling young people and their parents as to the limits of what education can do and where they should be directed. Um, I know a couple engineers who took drafting courses in high school and I think that's a critical part of the success that they had later in life. So, you know, we need to, uh, we, we need to spend a lot more time with these kids in the schools. So if we're going to spend $14,000, part of that needs to be spent in trying to directionalize them in a place where they're going to be successful. Because I go back to what I said earlier. School's about preparing for life, and preparing for life is earning a living to live it. We got about three minutes left here. Is there anything that uh, we haven't covered that you want the, uh, the listeners to know? Well, I think the one thing is that it's a community project. It's something where uh, I talked about the respect for the trades and for people in manufacturing. I think that starts in each home. I think when you talk to your kids around the supper table, uh, you know, you shouldn't, if, if you have a son or a daughter who wants to work with their hands, I think they should be encouraged. And don't be derogatory <laughs> right. about that, you know. It's, you know, it's uh, okay. It's okay. It is okay because, you Actually, know, it's better because you <laughs> probably have a more secure life when you actually have a skill that people need on a regular basis. Right. And you never know when mom or dad <clears throat> are going to need a plumber. And if you're handy, that will be really great for them. I think the other thing is we have to engage business as a full partner. And that, that requires push and pull from both sides. Um, business can't rely totally on the educational system or the government to prepare every worker for them. They have some skin in this game and they need to step up and, and, and participate. I think that's the big part of it. Uh, offer opportunities for internships, um, on the job experience, shadowing, things of that nature, because that's critical to kids. Again, it gets back those soft skills as well. It's an opportunity to hone those. It would be really helpful for young people if they could, <clears throat> excuse me, learn to, you know, like work with a, a father or a grandfather or, or a neighbor to learn how to maybe wire a house. If, if they're building a house in the neighborhood somewhere, you know, go in there. But I don't know that kids are allowed to touch stuff like that. And maybe that's part of the problem. Well, um, certainly they wouldn't un in a employer-employee relationship because there's, you know, child labor laws and, and a lot of restrictions. But a lot of times um, it just doesn't happen in the home because mom or dad just doesn't do that anymore. Uh, if they hire it done. <laughs> like the, the guy said, I, I just leave a check on the, on, the table. Uh, on the table for the plumber to come in and fix things. Well, and I would encourage anyone that watches this to Google micro testimony to Congress. It's a YouTube video. It'll be the eight best minutes they could spend getting a feel for what we're talking about in this country. I know that you watched it. And I, think it's, I just think it's a powerful piece. I agree, and it is a very, very worthwhile thing that people need to think about. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, it's very informative, and I hope that uh, your program can continue on and prosper. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. And uh, to the audience, I've been speaking with uh, uh, Dave Stecklin. Uh, he's with the uh, Madison County Training Department. Um, I forget the entire title of that organization, but they do a great job in helping young people to become adults. Thank you very much. Oh, this is going to be on YouTube, so if you want to show it to your friends, do show it. Thanks. <laughs>